Okay, um, so welcome Nicole and, and Genevieve and Kimberly. Uh, today is, it's actually kind of a big day. There's a lot of things going on. So let me share my screen and let's take a look at all the important things that we're going to be doing today. Okay, so I'll start out with Q&A as always. And then after that, we'll get into the sampling distribution, especially for means, but for anything. And then we'll get into the big theorem. That it's really the only theorem that we have of the whole quarter of the main theorems. And that is the central limit theorem. With a name like that, you know it's important. Um, so it, it is the big theorem. It allows us to do statistics. That's kind of important. So we'll talk about the central limit theorem for means. And then I'll tell you how to make money. You know, maybe you don't care about money, but hey, you know, if you can make money in an easy way without hurting anyone, go for it. And uh, we'll talk about different investment strategies and how the central limit theorem relates to it. So we'll look at, for example, um, a mutual fund versus an individual stock and kind of see what the differences are in the pros and cons using the central limit theorem. And then what we'll do is we'll look at the central limit theorem for proportions. So if you have a qualitative a yes, no question, can we use a central limit theorem? And there is a central limit theorem and definitely you can do it. And I'm gonna bring about that with uh, the elections. So we'll be talking about, uh, I think uh, opinion of Biden is the thought we're gonna be looking at. And then um, we'll get in the central limit theorem for sums pretty quickly. That's a smaller issue, but I figure I should just mention it. And then after that, I'll talk about the exam. So the exam one is coming up, depending on when you wanna take it, either Wednesday, Thursday, or Sunday. And very important, as um, one person already said, um, is, does this count for your grade? In a big way. So yes, just like the project. Okay, the project and the exams are the, the those are the biggies when it comes to worrying about your grade. Whereas the assignments is about worrying about learning. You know, if you don't do well on the assignment, then you should worry because then you may not do well on the exams. And same thing with the discussion post, same thing. So I'll be talking about that. Today might go a little longer than usual. Um, it's really hard. Um, it's really hard to know exactly how many minutes it's gonna take because it depends on how many questions you've got, how things are going, et cetera, et cetera. But if it goes a little longer, then that's the way it is with an exam review. So I wanna remind you, um, big things coming up. Oh, we got a question. Will the exam cover theorem? Um, will it cover the central limit theorem? The answer is exam one will not, exam two will. So for this week, no. Uh, my philosophy is that if you, haven't had, if you haven't had your assignment turned in yet, you know, the due date, then I shouldn't give you an exam on it. So everything that you'll have had an assignment on, and that's, up, you know, tonight, for example, you have assignments due for uh, chapter uh, six. And the idea is that, since it's due tonight, you should be ready for that material for the exam you take either Wednesday, Thursday, or Sunday. So hopefully that makes sense. So I wanna mention, um, is there an answer key to the practice? I guess I gotta look at the practice. I don't even remember the practice. There probably isn't, um, but I'll have to look. But there might be. That's a good question. Um, the practice exam is not, not the exam. So be careful about that. We'll be talking about what the exam looks like exactly, or kind of exactly. Okay, and I'll, those are good questions. We talk about the exam. These are all good questions about the exam. Um, but I wanna mention something, what big thing, and I don't mean your chapter six assignment or the discussion reply or the, or, the, um, or the secret word quiz, but what big thing is due tonight that is a big component of your course grade? Yeah, project one. Some of you have turned it in already, wonderful. Um, don't wait, I would not wait until 11.58 to hit submit because that's when your internet will go down or some bad thing will happen. I, you know, don't wait, don't wait till late tonight. Um, just bad things happen if you wait till the very last minute. Um, it's okay if you're still working on it now, but you know, it's not okay if you're just starting now, that'd be bad. 
but make sure that you, you give yourself a little bit of time before it's due. You never want to wait till the very last minute. That's just a suggestion. Uh, so project one is due, and just let you know, um, obviously right now I'm not looking at the discussion posts um, to see if there's any questions on it. Um, I might look a little bit after this, and then I'm going hiking for about three or four hours, and then I'll look again after that. So just let you know, I, I do have a life, and my friend and I are going, going out um, exploring beautiful Tahoe. So, um, but I will take a look after I get back and also right after this webinar, if there's questions about um, your project or anything else, um, Q&A form for anything else, project one, um, discussion board for the project questions. And I'll be happy to look. And um, I wanna remind you, um, the draft you sent me as an email, for the project one, should you be emailing me your project one? What do you think? Yeah, definitely not. Do not email me your project one. That, that's not the way you're supposed to do it. So in, in Canvas, you go to your assignments, you know, either on the bottom of the syllabus or in the uh, module for this week. And there's a project one link, you click it and there's a submission. And that's how you submit, pro you, that's how you submit project one. And very important is that make sure that on your paper that you're submitting are the names of all the people in your group. Because only one of you submits it on Canvas, but since it has the names of all the people, then, I, then everybody gets the same grade. So everyone in your group gets the same grade. Um, hopefully it'll be you know 97% or something. And then all of you, all three of you, get 97%. Okay, so that's the idea of, of this. So you only need to submit once, because there's only I don't want to have to look at it and then see it again somewhere else and go, did I read this already? It sounds familiar. Um, better for just one of you to submit. And uh, it'll make sure it's submitted. It'll tell you it got submitted successfully and then tell your partners you did it. And make sure your names are on it so I can give those points to each of the people on your, uh, in your group. Any questions? Any questions about um, the project? So again, that's our, our first big component of this course in terms of your grade. And hopefully you learned a lot from it. You know, that's the point of the project. Um, when I talked to students that I had that were my students like five to 10 years ago, they all tell me the project is what they learn from the most. And that's still in their brain. They still remember their project. Whereas all the other stuff they usually forget in five years. But the project is something very memorable. So, you know, I think that works the best of the course. Any questions? Okay, now let's talk about the big the big deal of this whole class, basically, and that is the central limit theorem. I'm gonna give you an idea of what's going on. So if you think about the, if you think about statistics, something I mentioned in the first five minutes of this entire course, what are statistics all about? And you remember? I don't see y'all jumping in. Analyzing data, okay, that's definitely one way of thinking about it. But I, I like to think about, you know, what's the point of it? You know, analyzing data might be fun, but what are you trying to do? What's your goal? Why, you know, in your project? What what was your client interested in? Thoughts? Okay, if you don't jump in, I'll tell you. Here we go. They want to pay us to find something out that's something, but something in particular. Um, n number n numbers in a set of data, not quite, not quite. What they what they care about is the population. Okay, they care, for example, if your if your um, population was all community college students in California. They care about community college students in California, right? The population. Unfortunately, all you could do 
when it comes to collecting data is get a sample. And the question is, how good is that sample? And in chapter one, we found out that bias is a problem. But even if you don't have bias, if you do a really good scientific study with almost no bias at all, will the, will the sample mean be the same as the population mean? What do you think? Because all you have to go by is a sample. Will that be the same as a population? Yeah, the problem is the sample mean is not the same as the population. So what you're interested in is saying, well, it's not the same. Does it, it's not useless either. But the question is, how useful is it? So one is that your best guess. So if you got your sample and you have an unbiased sample and you got the sample mean, do you think that's your best guess for the population mean? If all you know is a sample mean and you know that it was unbiased and maybe you did a sample size of 50 or something and you had to guess at the population mean, would the sample mean be your guess? Or would you guess something bigger or smaller? What do you think? Yeah, yeah. The sample means your best guess. You have nothing else to go by, so the sample means your best guess. And it turns out the sample mean, so let's write it out. The sample mean is the best est a guess for the population mean. Okay, so that's the first thing. Now that that's true of a lot of things. Um, what if you what if you were doing say um, height of Americans, and you surveyed fifty Americans? Then we said the sample mean is the best guess for the population mean. Do you think the sample maximum? Let's say let's say maximum. Do you think that's the best guess for the population maximum? What do you think? Definitely not. Definitely not. If you ask, if you look at 50 people at random and you look at the tallest of that 50 people, that tallest person is very unlikely to be anywhere near the height of the tallest person in America. Do you agree? Okay, so so the the sample maximum is a very bad guess for the population maximum. If it is the best guess. We call this an unbiased oops, the sample mean is an unbiased estimator for the population mean. Okay, I'm not going to prove this, but I think you guys can um, believe me. I mean, it feels like it should be. Um, all the proofs are hard, by the way. And there's another way of talking about that. What we can say is, let's suppose that you did, your, your, your job was to take samples of size 50. And you looked at many, many, many different samples of size 50, because that's what you do for your job. And you average all of those samples. And if you looked at all the possible samples you could ever take of the American population, and you averaged all of the sample means, then you're going to get the population mean. Okay, so this is central limit theorem part one. And I'm going to write it in symbols first. And what it says is you take 
the average of all of the sample means. So that's a population average because it's all of. So we're going to have a mu sub. And then we're going to have an X bar because it's the mean of the sample means. There's a bar over here I can do. Oh, there it is. There we go. So mu sub X bar is equal to mu. This is a very compact way of writing the central limit theorem part one. And let me read this again. Mu, hopefully you know because we've been using it for the last few weeks, that's the population mean. So let me write that down. So mu is the population mean. And mu sub x bar is the mean of all the possible sample means. So again, if your sample size is size 50 it's, and it's all Americans, it's all, if you look at every possible group of 50 Americans that could ever happen, each of those, each of those groups will have an average. Now, if you take the average of all those averages, that's called mu sub x bar. So this is called, the mean of the sampling distribution. So let me ask, anyone lost? It's kind of fancy notation. Any questions, everyone okay with this? Okay, so again, we call this the mean of the sampling distribution. The symbol we're going to use is mu subscript x with a bar under it, okay? And it's the population mean of all possible sample means. The mu is population mean, x bar is sample mean, and that's why this notation. Any questions so far? Okay, now if we have a list of all the sample means, one thing you might be interested in the mean of those, and that was mu sub x bar. What else have we done in this class that is a statistic that you might be interested in when we have a list of a bunch of values? What's our other big statistic besides the mean? Hopefully I've hammered it in enough in the last four weeks. Yeah, the standard deviation. So the standard deviation, so we have this list of all possible sample means, and that's a list of numbers. And when you have a list of numbers, you could find out the standard deviation of those numbers. Okay, now we saw that mu sub x bar is equal to mu. Any guess on what sigma sub x bar might be? Any guess? I don't see y'all guessing. Okay, the guess might be sigma. That's what I'm expecting, by the way. Um, and that turns out that wouldn't be good. We could do a lot better. And here's the idea. And hopefully you're you're you got this kind of idea already, is that if you have a very large sample and it's unbiased, 
then do you think that your sample mean is likely to be closer to the population mean compared to having a small sample? What do you think? So if you asked, say, a million Americans instead of 100 Americans, yeah, the, the million American sample mean is going to be more likely to be close to the population mean than 100 Americans is going to be. Do you see that? Now, how likely you are to be close to the mean, the measure of how far you are or what, how far stuff typically is from the mean, that is the standard deviation. Is that clear? So it turns out the bigger the sample size, the smaller the standard deviation of all possible sample means is going to be. And the formula is as follows. And I did not expect you to guess the formula, but if you think about it, it ought to get small as n gets large. And it does. So we take our population standard deviation, and then we divide it by the square root of the sample size. So I'm going to make this a little bigger because it's, an, it's a biggie. It's one of the most important equations of this whole class. And that is sigma sub x bar is equal to sigma over the square root of n. So if you have a sample size 100 times bigger than your sigma sub x bar, will be 10 times smaller. And that tells you you're more likely to be 10 times closer to the population mean than had you not done 100 times more in your sample. Any questions on this idea? Any questions? OK. There's a lot of symbols here, so I want you to get used to all the different things we're doing. So first thing, for the mean, there's the population mean mu, the sample mean x bar, and then the mean of the sampling distribution, mu sub x bar. Okay, similarly, for the standard deviation, there's a population standard deviation sigma, there's a sample standard deviation s, and then there is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, sigma sub x bar. So just a note, sigma sub x bar is so important. It has a special name. It is called The standard error, because it tells you kind of how much of an error do you think you have when you're using your sample mean as a guess for the population mean. It is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. And remember, the sampling distribution is all possible sample means with that sample size. So a lot of theory. Any questions? Any questions at all about anything here? OK, we're going to use it in a second. Any questions? OK, what I want to do is I want to bring about um, my favorite example. OK, and I'll let you know I have made pretty much money with this example. What do you think that example is? And when I say pretty much, we're talking about probably over $100,000.
definitely over a hundred thousand dollars. Not gambling. I've not made over a hundred thousand dollars gambling. I'd be long dead by now because they would have killed me if I kept playing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, investing. So, by the way, gambling, gambling's fun. You can make a little money if you're really, really good at it, but not that much. You're, you're not going to be a millionaire from gambling. But investing, which is kind of the, I don't know, the polite way of gambling, maybe. <laughs> so I figured I'd pop this in. Um, this is a site I usually go to, uh, uh, Watch. I don't know if you've seen the site, but this is a site for investing. And I have invested in different ways. And I want to mention a, a few things. One way of investing, for example, I did about a week ago, um, was I bought a stock. Okay. And if you're interested, I bought two stocks actually, but I, I bought, let's just look at one of them. Uh, I bought AT and T. I hope you hope you've heard of that company. Okay, I actually worked for AT and T when I was in college, but that's not why I bought the stock. Um, so I bought AT and T, um, and my idea is that stock might go up and it might go down. Do you agree? Do you think do you think it's more likely to go up or down? Yeah, it's definitely more likely to go up. Does it mean it can't go down? Yeah, it does not mean it cannot go down. Okay, it can go down. And it goes up and down and that happens, right? So if you look, for example, um, say a one year period, then you know between when I bought it a week ago and a year from now, it might go up, it might go down. And let's consider a one year period, it's a little easier to talk about. So it might go up, it might go down, but the expected value, anyone know the expected value of individual stocks? Which is the mean, by the way? So what do you think the mean, what do you think the mean changes, percent change of individual stocks? Any thought? Do we have any investors here? Okay, none of you know. Okay, let's write this out. So the mean change for individual stocks is about 8%. Okay, and I'm going to let percents be the unit, so I don't have to use 0.08. I'll just use 8. Sound good? So the mean change for individual stocks is 8%. Okay, you're going to say 10. It's gone down a bit. It used to be 12 when I was first investing, and it's gone down to about 8%. I think that's because of 2008. Okay, so the mean, the mean change is about 8%. Okay, the standard deviation is, is pretty high. Standard deviation is around 14%. Okay, I don't know this exactly, but that feels about right. Okay, so if I invest in an individual stock, individual stock and we're gonna assume a normal distribution. Okay, if I invest in an individual stock, okay, and I look to next year, so I invested at and for example, do you think that stock, will that stock be up next year? Do you think there's risk that it'll be lower than what I bought it at in a year? Yeah, yeah, there's definitely risk. And we can see that because of this 14%. Right? Because remember, there's about a 16% chance that you're farther than one standard deviation below the mean. Do you remember that? Right? That was 68% was within one, subtract from one, and you get 32%, um, divide by two, and you get 16%. So we talked about that last week. Okay, so, there's a, so this, this is a review from last week. So there's a pretty big chance that it's gonna lose money, 
Okay. So to let you know, I call this my play money. Okay, which is say very different than the money I invested a very long time ago when my daughter was born. When my daughter was born, then I wanted to make sure that I could pay for her college. And I really would feel horrible about myself if I took the money that I invested for her college education and it went down and I couldn't pay for her college because I was a bad investor and it just went down. Do y'all agree that's, you know, would make me feel bad. I don't know if it'll make you feel bad if you're a parent or going to be a parent. Okay, so what I wanted to do is I wanted an investment that didn't have this big risk. Any questions on that? Okay, and in fact, we can find, find the probability of losing money. In the, in the year. Well, that's actually not that hard. Okay, all I do, again, I'm assuming a normal distribution. So I can go over here. And I go to my calculator. And I can go ahead and go to the normal distribution. Okay, if I lose money, then that means, what does that tell you about how much money I made? Between what and what? If I lose money. Yeah, between negative 9999 and what? Not eight, because hey, if I if I got seven percent, that's not losing money, that's making money. Seven percent on your investment is making money. Do you all agree? What's the boundary of making and losing money? No, not nine 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 nine. Zero. Anything negative is losing money. Do you agree? Anything positive is gaining money. The mean was eight percent. Standard deviation was 14%. Any questions so far? And I can hit calculate. And the probability of losing money is around 28%. So the answer is 28%. Okay, and I may not feel good about that. Okay, by the way, if I wanted to not lose money and know I'm not going to lose money, what could I do? If I want to be assured that I'm not going to lose money. What can I do? Put it as low as zero, I can put it in the bank. <laughs> You've all heard of that investment, right? The bank is called FDIC insured, which means that even if the bank goes bankrupt, I get, I, I get my money back. I don't know if you all know that law, but that's part of the law. Do I have money in the bank? What do you think? Is it a good idea? Yeah, of course I have money in the bank because that's for me day-to-day -day stuff. Okay, that's really the only reason I have money in the bank. But there's another option. So no, for putting it in the bank, what is the standard deviation of the earnings if you put it in the bank? And this is very easy, and you should all know this. Yeah, it's zero. You know exactly what's going to happen. That's a zero standard deviation. 
Okay. All right. What's the problem with put in the bank? I got standard deviation zero. Yeah, your mean, your your your, your percent increase is around 0.5% or something like that, right? Okay, and that's if you're lucky. That banking right now is terrible when it comes to interest. Okay, so if, if you want to, you know, have a high, if you want to have a high mean, the bank is a very bad idea. Stock is much better because that's eight percent. But if you want to have low risk, the bank is better. If you want to have no risk, is there another option? So is there another option besides buying a stock and putting money in the bank? Okay, 401k, that could be a stock, by the way. And I, I'm not going to get into the 401k because it's very complicated. But it might be what you're thinking, even though you don't know exactly what a 401k does. But it, what you're probably thinking is, here's another solution. And that is mutual funds. You know what a mutual fund is? Okay, so here's what it is. You're giving money to a company. That company takes your money and money from a lot of other people. And they take that money and they don't invest in a stock, but what they do is they invest in many stocks. Okay, they invest in many stocks. So I'm gonna look in particular, the Dow index fund. Okay, so what the Dow index fund does is it invests in the Dow Jones. Okay, and I'm gonna simplify things a bit just because um, Again, this is just elementary stats, but the Dow Jones is, I'm gonna open this up. I, I'm sure you've all heard of the Dow Jones. How many stocks are in the Dow Jones? Anyone know? And it was a good day for the Dow on, on uh, Friday. How many stocks are in the Dow Jones? Okay, so if you don't know, I'll tell you. 2,000, good guess, but no, <laughs> 30. 30. Um, so the Dow Jones has 30 stocks. Now we're going to assume that the stocks move independently of each other. So I'll let you know this is a bad assumption. So again, I'm simplifying things because it's elementary stats, but you could get more advanced if you want. But we're gonna assume they move independently of each other. So if one goes up, you don't know what the other's gonna do. Over the long term, actually, it's pretty about it's pretty right, but not over a one year. But over a long term, so for example, when I um when I invested when my daughter was born for her college education then the independence works pretty well because it's over 18 years of time or 17 because she was 17 when she went to college. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, well, now what happens is you invest your money in this Dow Jones index fund and that money is put into 30 different stocks. And what you get is the average of the 30 stocks. Any questions on that? So what we can do is the first thing, and let me remind you, is mu sub x bar equals mu. Because now we're talking about an average. We're talking about a sample. The Dow Jones is a sample. And mu, by the way, was 8%. And sigma sub x bar is sigma over root n.
And that is equal to, well, let's calculate this out. Okay, what was sigma, do you remember? We've already done it, what was sigma? Yeah, 14, that's given. What then? Thirty, and I can go and I can just take fourteen divided by the square root of thirty, and I get about two point five five six. Let me stop for a moment because this is very important that you know how to do this. Any questions on how I calculated the standard error? which is a standard deviation of the sampling distribution. It tells you how likely my standard deviation, my mean is gonna be to 8%, right? Cause I'd like 8%, I don't want a half a percent that, I could get that by putting in the bank. But by going in the Dow Jones, instead of an individual stock, my standard deviation went way down. Way down. It used to be 14, and now it's 2.556. Will you be calculating on a calculator? Now we're going to. The 14 over root 30, I just throw in Google, that's fastest. Um, but now we got it. now let's calculate the probability of losing money with a mutual fund. So now I'm gonna take the calculator and everything is the same, except the 14 is now 2.556. Any questions on that? So now I go ahead and hit calculate and I get 0 0.00087. So we can say that the probability of losing money is equal to 0 0.00, how many zeros? Three zeros and then an eight seven. So take a look. Now, putting in the Dow Jones instead of putting it in a single stock. Do you think I felt comfortable putting it in a mutual fund to invest in my daughter's education? If my chance of losing money is 0 0.00087. Yeah. And I get 8% interest instead of a half a percent interest. Any questions on that? By the way, when you put money in the bank, what do you think the bank does with it? Yeah, they do two things. One is they invest it. Okay, they give you half percent, they get 8%. The other is they do mortgages. You give them a half percent and they get whatever a, a mortgage is, like a 30 year mortgage, whatever. Okay, and that might be, what is it, four or 5% now. But the point is that they make money on your money. Any questions on that? Two and a half percent, wow, it's really low. <laughs> I don't have a mortgage anymore, so I used to care. Because, by the way, um, I understand statistics very well and I know how to invest. And because of that, I don't, I don't owe any money anymore and I have a lot of stock. Okay, not billions, but, but enough to feel comfortable. And it's all about that, okay? And it's about starting young, by the way. Saving early, starting young, investing in stock in the right way instead of putting it in the bank. And again, this is a big lesson, by the way, that will change your life in the long term. You know, and I'm, I'm older now, so I'm at the point where it, it happened, okay? I'm not a billionaire, because I'm a teacher, but I'm comfortable.
Any questions on this? Any questions? Okay, one more thing. Do you think the mutual fund is always better than the individual stock? What do you think? Okay, it's always safer, that's true. But what, what are the pros of an individual stock? Yeah, you, you have a chance of making a lot of money. Okay, so for example, remember the normal distributions are symmetric. So the chance of losing money will be the same as a chance of making 16% or higher. So you have, with a mutual fund, you have almost no chance of making 16% or higher. But you have a 28% chance with an individual stock of making 16% or higher. Okay, so again, there's a standard deviation does not say that you're going to make less money. What it says is if your standard deviation is higher, that you're not sure of how much money you're going to make. You might make a lot more or you might make a lot less than the mean. And if the standard deviation is very small, then you're likely to make very close to the mean. Any questions on that? Any questions? Okay, and by the way, um, to be honest, there's a reason I don't invest in mutual funds anymore. Anyone know? The answer is I'm a statistician. And what I do is I look at individual stocks, many of them, and I wait until I find a pattern that other people haven't found. And then I invest in that stock and I have usually a 30% return. Okay, just to let you know. Okay, and that's because I can find patterns. But you have to know a lot of statistics and political science too. You gotta look at the combination of the two. Um, and you can make money that way. So I've learned how to make pretty much money in the stock market. Okay, again, not billions, but definitely lots of money, you know, many thousands. Any questions at all on this example? Okay. We had to make an assumption. What was the assumption? We had to make the assumption it was independent. Can I recommend for you in the future? My recommendation is to do um, um, fictitious money first. In other words, don't you just pretend like you have money and pretend you invested and play with it for a year or two. And then if you're doing well, then put real money in because then you're good. And if you're not doing well, then change your strategies for playing until you get good. <laughs> so that's my recommendation is learn how to get good and then put money in. Okay, but mutual funds are always safe. Okay, so let me, or basically safe, long-term they're safe, not one year necessarily. Okay. Um, so one of the things is that we had to make sure that we had independent, unbiased sample, but there was another assumption we had to make. What was the other assumption to be able to do this calculation? It was a biggie. Independent, but that was one I already said. What was the other assumption? We didn't assume a population. Starts with an N. Yeah, we assumed that we had a normal distribution. Okay. And here's the problem. Individual stocks do not follow a normal distribution. Okay, I'll just let you know they don't. So individual stocks do not follow a normal distribution, but here comes the biggie. This is called the central limit theorem.
I'm calling it part three. Um, by the way, part one, part two, part three, um, that's my way of writing things. That's not necessarily standard, but I think it helps to organize things if I put into parts, because there's three big pieces of the central limit theorem. The first is that the, populate, the sample mean is an unbiased estimator. So the sampling distribution of the mean is the same as the population mean. The second is that the standard error is sigma over root n, and here comes a third. And the third has two situations. Situation one is that if the original distribution is normal, so is the sampling distribution. Okay, now the situation one is less likely. Sometimes you gotta assume it because it's all you got. Situation two. And situation two is the biggie. For a large sample size, any guess on how big a sample size, especially in this class, we're going to call large. The hint is I've given you a subliminal message about it already, not today. Nine, 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 nine is a good guess because we have had that number a lot, but no. <laughs> What's the other big number we've had about sample size? Real important number. I'll write it down and then you'll say, oh yeah, of course. N must be greater than 30. When have you heard that? It's important today, that's a hint. Yeah, your project, okay? There's a reason why I made you do more than 30 and this is it. Because you need to have more than 30 to have good data. Good data means you can apply the central limit theorem. So for a large sample size, and in our class we can call it n greater than 30, 30 gives you about one decimal place of accuracy. If you want two decimal places, you need around 100. So just let you know, so we're going for 30. The sampling distribution is approximately normal. So that is very important. What it does is it tells you that if you have a large enough sample size, then you know how to do calculations. Because if you don't know the distribution, you can't calculate a probability. But if you know the distribution is normal, then you can always calculate probabilities. So that's a big deal. Do you agree? All right. So that's the central limit theorem for means. So let's state the central limit theorem. For proportions. Just to let you know, because I'm not going to have time to spend any major time on this, but I want to mention it. If instead of the mean, you're interested in the sum, so kind of the best example of that I think is in business. You don't care about the average amount people spent that day at your store. You care about the total amount, how much money that fell into your cash register that day. So it turns out if you want this, if, if you're looking at the central limit theorem for totals, then sigma subtotal is going to be n, I sorry, mu subtotal is going to be n times mu, and sigma subtotal will be instead of sigma over root n, it'll be sigma times root n. 
So you can look in the book, it talks about it, the longer lecture, I also have it talked about, um, but I wanna mention it to say that I did it. Um, and you can look at examples with that. But proportions are more important and I wanna mention this. Okay, and that is the following. So again, this will be one, two, and three. So one is that the mean, so we can still talk about a mean. I don't want to yes, no question. You don't usually think of a mean. But again, if you're taking samples and many samples, each sample has a proportion, we could take the mean of all those proportions. So it's going to be mu sub p hat. is equal to P. So if you look at the average of all possible sample proportions, that'll give you the population proportion. Not a big surprise, hopefully not. Okay, the, other, the next one um, was one you won't guess. And that is sigma, the standard deviation of all possible sample proportions. Sigma sub P hat. is equal to, well, there is no sigma like before. You can't do sigma over root n. So instead, what we do is the following. Actually, it's this way. Square root of the fraction p times 1 minus p all over n. Okay, and that's one of those trust me on, there's no way I'm gonna explain how that came up. But you can trust me as a mathematician, it, it works. I'm not the one that proved it, but I understand the proof. Um, so the main thing to look at is that we have an n, we have a root n in the bottom, just like before. So the bigger the sample size, the better off you are. Number three. Okay, number three, Similar, but not the same as the old number three. So now if the sample size is large, any guess on what large means? Okay, so I wanna let you know, be careful about going with your guess. It's wrong, <laughs> okay? So it's greater than 30 does not work with proportions, okay? Don't make that mistake. Instead, what you need is you need to have NP greater than five and N times one minus P greater than five. So just to let you know, NP is the number of yeses that you expect to get. And n times 1 minus p is a number of no's. So what you have to have is the expected number of yeses and the expected number of no's are both larger than 5. Then the sampling distribution is approximately normal. Any questions at all on the central limit theorem for, proportion, for, for proportions? Um, so the five, this is where you gotta trust me. The five gives you about a decimal place of accuracy. So this, this is theory and this is elementary stats, not math major statistics. So no, <laughs> just remember it. Okay, that, okay, and not for the exam this time, but for the next exam, you know, in four weeks or so. Okay, so there's, there's a lot of things you're going to have to trust me on. I mean, the square root of P times 1 minus P over N, I'm sure none of you like looked at that and said, oh, that's what I was thinking. No, no, there, there's, a, there's deep math behind all of this. 
there's really deep math. So again, I do my best to explain it to you, but what I'm not going to do is prove it to you because it's very deep. Okay. Uh, Yeah, no, it's definitely not part of the problem. It'll always be true in this class that if you if you want to use essential limit theorem propor proportions, then NP needs to be bigger than five, N times one minus P needs to be bigger than five also. And then you can. So small sample sizes are bad. And if you have a small probability or a small percentage of yeses, then you need a much higher sample size. Okay, so let me give you an example. Okay, what's the most important example this year? Or these last six months? Example in the world? Come on, you should all know this. This is not math. Yeah, COVID. Okay, so if you're looking at a vaccine, and you want to test it to find out if it works. What do you think the probability of a randomly selected American, for example, is that they're gonna die of COVID? Okay, or even get COVID. What do you think the probability is that a randomly selected American in the next, say, month and a half is going to have COVID, okay? Maybe one in a thousand. So notice that in this case, if you want a sample size that is large enough, so if you're going to be testing, say, Moderna or Oxford or one of these major companies that are testing their vaccine, and they're going to be testing people by giving them the vaccine and seeing if it works, then we need to make sure that N and P is greater than five. Well, if P is one in a thousand of getting COVID, then you need to have over 5,000 people to get the vaccine as in a trial run, just to have the minimum to be able to say that we can use the central limit theorem. Okay, now you need to do a little better. It's actually, um, if you wanna look at death, for example, we're not even talking about one in a thousand anymore. So now we're talking about maybe one in 30,000. And that's why they have to have 30,000 in their trials. This is the reason, because they need to use the central limit theorem for proportions or they don't have good statistics. And do you think there are statistics, do you think there are statisticians working for Moderna and these other uh, vaccine companies? Absolutely, absolutely. They have teams of statisticians because they want to get it right because getting it wrong could end up with thousands of people dying. Okay, so you hire people. Just let you know, stats is absolutely important, especially today. Okay, whereas the one I'm going to show you now, no one's going to die, at least I don't think anyone's going to die if they get this wrong, but we still might care. So let's think of this one. Okay, so here's Gallup's, here's a Gallup poll. Majority trust Biden to lead healthcare system amid COVID-19. Do you believe Gallup? Do you believe this, do you believe this article's true? Just this, what do you think? Okay, could be a bias. Let's assume they don't have bias. Okay, haven't heard of it. Well, here it is. I, I'm not making it up. I, I got this off the news. Okay, is a Gallup poll. So they asked people. And they found out that 52% trust Biden. Is that the majority? Okay, it is, except this is a sample. This is not all Americans. How do I know 
that they didn't ask all Americans? How do I know for sure? My guess is you know for sure also. How do I know they took a sample instead of knowing about all Americans? Yeah, they didn't ask me either. Okay, and they didn't ask you either. Okay, in fact, I've never had anyone say they asked me. <laughs> okay, one of these years, maybe it'll happen, but I doubt it. Okay, they didn't ask me, so they don't know. What did they do? They took a sample. So we can scroll to the bottom. Typically, they have the stuff we need for stats in the bottom. And they took a sample. And the sample had 1,518 Americans, adults. By the way, adult age 18, it's not just me. I wasn't being picky about the project. Okay, Gallup is the same way. You don't ask children, got it? <laughs> okay, it's so hard to deal with, with surveys with children. So Gallup doesn't even bother, and I don't either. Okay, but they asked 1,518. And we're going to assume that it was randomly sampled with no bias, okay? That may be wrong. I don't know. I have no idea, okay? We can look and, you know, at least there's going to be some hints that there's less bias. But we're going to make that assumption. Okay, so we have 1518. Okay, and remember, 52% were the number of were the percent of Americans of, in the sample that said yes, they trust Biden. Okay, so just a note: this is good to do. Just pop in our calculator. 1518 times 0.52, and I'm going to round because you can't have 789.36 people say yes. So I'm going to say 789. And that's how many people said yes. Got it? Okay, so let's do some stuff. This one. So first thing, we're going to assume that everything was the 52% that was given in the article. Let me go to the top. Yeah, that's right here. So 52% Americans trust Joe Biden. Okay. And they're calling that the majority. And we want to see, do they know? Okay. So any questions on that? All right, so let me ask if it wasn't the majority. Okay, let's go the closest to majority without being the majority. What's the closest to the majority without being the majority? Hopefully you know this. It's not a fancy stats question. Not 49, 50. Not 51, 50. Majority means more than 50. Okay, so if exactly 50% of Americans trust Biden with COVID, What would be the probability that 1518 randomly selected Americans? would have ah, sorry, I want to go backwards. If exactly 52%, what would be the probability that 1518 randomly selected Americans would have 50% or less thinking or trusting 
Biden. Any questions on this idea? And we can go either direction. So the idea is, is 52% high enough, far enough from 50 that we can say, well, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's not the majority or really we're pretty sure it's the majority for the whole population. Any questions on that? All right, so what can we do? Actually, I think I want to go the other way. I want to go 50% of Americans trust Biden with COVID. What would be the probability that 1,518 would have 52% or more? Okay, so if it was 50%, which isn't the majority, then how unlikely would it be to have at least 52%? All right, well, what do we have to do? Well, first, if we say if it was exactly 50%, then that means that mu equals 0.5. Any questions on that? Because that's what 50% means. And then sigma. And I guess I should go sub p hat. Okay, so these. So sigma sub p hat. Well, let's calculate that. That's going to be a big old square root of the fraction. 0 0.5 times 1 minus 0 0.5 divided by 1518. Okay, and let's calculate this thing. 1518, I gotta remember that. Square root of 0 0.5 times 1 minus 0 0.5 is 0 0.5, by the way. Divided by 1518, take a square root, you get 0 0.0128. Any questions on that? Okay, so now we can find the probability that our proportion, our sample proportion, and the sample proportion is p hat, is at least as big as 0.52. So we can go back to our calculator because we know uh, we better check before we use our calculator. In order to use the normal distribution, what do we have to check for? What do we have to check? You'll be using normal distribution in the theorem, number three of the theorem. Very important, so I'm hoping you get this. Mm 
Yeah, not the sample size is greater than five, but the NP and the NQ. So NP equals uh, 1518 times 0 0.5. And I don't need a calculator to know that half of 1518 is definitely bigger than five, right? Over 700. And also NQ. By the way, NQ, I haven't used that yet, so I figure I better now. That's N times one minus P, it's shorthand. They often use Q to be the proportion of no's. And that's equal to 15, 18 times one minus 0.5, which is the same thing, by the way, also bigger than five. And because of that, I'm allowed to use my calculator. So now the low is 0.52, the high is one, 100%. The mean was 0.5 and the standard deviation is 0 0.0128. Any questions on this? And the nice thing is with proportions or means, as long as you're talking samples and you have a large enough sample size, normal distribution always works. So it's so much easier. You don't need a calculator for every situation in the universe. You just need the normal curve. And it calculate and 0 0.059. So this probability is equal to 0 0.059, or about a 6% a chance. So notice that there's a 6% chance, and that's if they did everything right. That's if they have a random sample. There's a 6% chance that they're wrong. Now, do you think they're okay with that? What do you think? You think Gallup's okay with that? Because they're the ones that publish this in their news. And the answer is yes, because here it is. They weren't okay, they wouldn't have, they wouldn't have done this, right? So you have to decide for yourselves, you know, if you're gonna be doing some work is, are you okay with being wrong 6% of the time? Does that make sense? Okay, it turns out that typically 6% is not good enough. Usually you want less than 5%, but sometimes 6% they'll go with. Okay, so this word majority may be wrong. There's a 6% chance that that word is wrong, that the majority don't trust Biden. Okay, on the other hand, had we compared to Trump, we would have gotten a, a close to zero, maybe zero, a zero probability if we use 39% instead of the 50%, just let you know. So they can be very comfortable, it turns out, that people trust Biden more than they trust Trump if they have an unbiased survey. Any questions at all about the confidence in, I mean, the, um, the central limit theorem for proportions? It's very, very useful. It allows you to take a survey and analyze it, okay? To collect data and then do something with it instead of just guess. You can actually look at these probabilities and understand. Are, is, our, is our data reliable or is it unreliable? So what is the probability that what we think is right is not right, right? In this case, that the majority trust Biden for COVID. And here at 6%, okay? Very small probability of being wrong on this one, okay? But not, not such a small probability that you would like 
be shocked. Any questions on that? Okay, if there's no questions, before I talk about the exam, I want to give you a secret word. Okay, can scroll up. Tell me how high, that high? Okay, but I wanna give you a secret word. And the secret word of the day is root. And it's root because if you notice that in the standard error formula, there's a square root there, okay? It's over the square root of n when we're talking about um, sigma sub x bar. And it's a square root of p times one minus p over n when we're talking about sigma sub p hat. So I figure root is a good word because that reminds you that there's something going on. Can I scroll down now? Because I want to get to the exam now. Are you okay if I leave this? Okay. So when is your exam? When must you take the exam? Okay, you actually have three different choices, not two. So Wednesday at 6 p.m., Thursday at 6 p.m., not Friday, or Sunday at, um, 11 a.m. Okay, and note, by the way, in case you're not living in California, this is PST, Pacific Standard Time. Okay, it's not your personal time. Okay, if you happen to be living in London or something. So this is PST. Okay, so that's the time at which you must take the exam. Do you take all three of them? No, <laughs> no, okay, you only get to take one, and the one you take first, so if you accidentally take more than one, I'll ignore anything you took after the first one. So you only take one, you either take Wednesday, Thursday, or Sunday. I did my best, and I'm not perfect, but I tried to make sure that they're all the same difficulty. Okay, all three of them are the same difficulty as best I could do. So it's not that easy for me to know exactly how hard things are gonna be for you, but I did my best. And they, and they also test on the same stuff. Okay, even the order is basically the same, the order at which you do things. And now I'm gonna show you in a bit what you have to do. Okay, so, the, so one thing is, in terms of the exam environment, where do you go to take your exam? Okay, anywhere, okay, at your own computer. Okay, so the exam is to be taken at your own computer. Huh. Google doesn't like my grammar. Maybe on. <laughs> yeah, it wants on. Okay, so that's where the exam is to be taken. You must use Proctorio. And that is a system that proctors your exam by watching you with a webcam. So I wanna mention, because some people get creeped out by this. There is no person watching you, got it? 
There's only one person actually in the world that has access to the video recording. You know who that person is? Yeah, me. <laughs> okay. So this isn't any different. Okay. In fact, it's even more private than taking it in class, like in a, you know, in 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 my lecture room or something like that, if we were in a face-to-face -face class without COVID. Okay. In fact, it's more private because your classmates can't see you. Right? When you're in class, your classmates get to watch you. Um, I'm the only one that can see you. And to be honest, most of the time, I don't even bother. I don't even look at the webcam. So let me tell you what Proctorio does. Proctorio will pop a red flag up if it suspects using artificial intelligence that there might be something weird going on. Okay, got it? So if that red flag has popped up, again, there is no person Proctorio. Then it just tells me, hey, look at this time. At, you know, after 15 minutes and 30 seconds, something weird happened. Then I look at it at 15.30. And if nothing weird happened, then no problem. But if I see you talking to someone and asking them how to do a problem, there's a problem. So that's kind of how Proctorio works. So most of the time, I never even bother. Okay, so let me tell you how, let me tell you how it's gonna start. The first thing that's gonna happen is it's gonna ask you for your ID. So you need to show your ID and the ID could be your driver's license. It could be your college ID, your photo ID from the college. It could be your passport, any picture ID. I'll even take a visa card. I promise you I'm not interested in your visa card number. <laughs> Okay, and I'm the only one who gets to look at it, I promise you. Okay, I'd much rather make money in the stock market than steal it from someone. I'm not someone that steals money. But hopefully you, don't, you have a driver's license or something like that. Any picture ID will work. Another college ID will work too. Okay, as long as it's a real college. So if you have say, um, um, Modesto Junior College's picture ID, that works just fine. It needs to be a college, it needs to be a picture ID an official picture ID, got it? Any official picture ID is fine, okay? Now, you have to have a computer with a webcam. That is a requirement I told you on day one of this class. If you don't, what can you do? It's not too late, but it will be in a, in a day or two. What can you do if you don't have a computer with a webcam? Yeah, you can get one from our college, okay? But if you don't live in Tahoe, you're gonna have to drive to Tahoe, okay? But you can't just go there and pick one up. You have to arrange a day ahead of time to schedule a time because of COVID. They have to do one-on-one -on -one scheduling, okay? So just let you know, um, you can do that. And if, it, if, you're, if something I'm proud of is I made this happen. Okay, not just for our college, but for all education in all of Tahoe. Okay, that includes third graders, seniors in high school, college students, whatever. That was one of the things that I thought was important. And I can feel proud about that. If you don't like it, you can blame me too, that people get free computers. But most people are okay with that. <laughs> okay, but they're cheap. They're not expensive computers. You do have to give it back at the end of the quarter, by the way. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, your grandkid, if he goes to one of our um, Lake Tahoe Unified School District schools, gets a computer because I made that happen. I was on the school board and that was one of the big things I went for. And then at this college, I made it happen. So anyway, and of course, you know, other people listen, you can thank them too. So that's just a note. You have to have the computer. You also have to use Chrome. Got it? So if you don't have Chrome, do you know what it costs to download Chrome on your computer? Zero, okay? I don't feel bad at all if you don't have to pay anything. Okay, you have to use Chrome. There's a plugin that you have to use in Chrome. So what I did, and I can pop this in.
if you go to the syllabus, and oops, you go to the exam, then you'll see proctorial practice quiz. And this is what you should all do well before you take the exam to make sure your computer works. And uh, yours will look a little different. I hit preview, yours doesn't happen. And yours will look a little different. Um, proctorial practice quiz. Unfortunately, I can't actually practice proctorial, but you can. And you'll find out if it works. In fact, this quiz has one question on it. Did it work for you? That's it. Okay. There's basically no points for this quiz. I think I said it at a hundred times you can take this. So make sure it works before you take the stressful exam. Do this one. And if you can't use Proctorio, then you got to deal with it and don't wait till the last minute. So I recommend doing this today is do this practice. If this works for you and you can get to this question and answer it, then you'll be ready for the test. If you can't, then you need to get things set up right. Any questions on that? Okay. And by the way, uh, in the old days, I didn't use Proctorio. I did regular Proctor tests where you go to a Proctor Center. So if you're in Tahoe, you went to our library. If you, otherwise you go to like your own local library typically. Do you know why I'm not doing that now? My guess is you should all know that. Why I stopped doing it? Yeah, COVID, because everything's closed. Okay, our library at our college is closed, so I can't do it anymore. Okay, um, when we get back, and we will eventually get back, then we'll get back to regular practice test. So I'm doing the best I can under the circumstances. Any questions so far? Okay, the exam is a two hour timed exam. Okay, so you have, if you take it on Wednesday or Thursday, you have 6 p.m. until 8, 8 p.m. If you take it on Sunday, you have 11 a.m. until 1 p.m. And then it closes on you. Any questions on that? Okay, and over a week ago, I, you know, posted a, an announcement saying, if anyone can't make it in those days, you need to let me know right away. And nobody did. So I'm assuming that everybody could make it in one of those times because at this point it's too late because you've had lots of time. Okay, and the reason I chose these times, by the way, is these were like the requested webinar times. Okay, I know you Monday, Tuesday, and we, we usually have it, but I figured Wednesday and Thursday are similar to Monday and Tuesday, and I wanted it later in the week instead of the beginning of the week so you had time to study after the project. And then Sunday, right now, we're on Sunday, so that's why I let it be 11, uh, 11 o'clock. So hopefully that was good for everyone. If not, then it's because you didn't say anything. But you have to make sure that you can make one of those times. Any questions so far? Okay, do you want to see word for word question one of the exam? Uh, since it's time, can we skip ahead to the answer we get and come back to the ones we need to work over? Yeah, as long as you don't hit submit, you can do whatever you want. Okay, so here's question one. If you get question one wrong, you got problems, okay? One is maybe you're a cheater and that's one problem. The other one is maybe you forgot your name. That's a bigger problem, <laughs> okay? Write, down, write your name below if you agree not to not communicate with any adult and not use any other devices or materials for this exam that have not already been expressly allowed by your instructor, okay? So first thing, what materials are you allowed to have on the exam? Because I've already talked about this. Yeah, you can have a three by five note card, writing in front and back. 
just pop it up on the screen so the so proctorio doesn't give you a red flag when you start using it and then you can also use a blank piece of paper pop the blank piece of paper on the screen at the beginning of your test and then proctorio will know okay i want to let you know my definition of adult is more of the ancient definition of adult you know the ancient definition of adult instead of the modern definition? I don't see y'all know. Yeah. So the ancient definition is basically post-pubescent. <laughs> okay, so basically over 12 years old, I'm calling an adult. Got it? <laughs> Okay, and here's the reason. Um, I understand that you're deal. some of you may be parents and you're dealing with having your children at home. And if your child is prepubescent, then you got to help your child. I mean, I understand that. If your child is postpubescent, you could tell your child, just don't bother me, wait two hours. Sound right? And if they're 15 year olds, they'll scream at you because they're 15 year olds. <laughs> That's called 15 year olds. But you can tell them, don't bother me for these two hours, okay? But if you have a baby, I understand, okay? That's different, okay? And if you need to deal with your baby, then you deal with your baby. Any questions on that? Okay, and by the way, if you take the exam on Wednesday, don't tell, all your, don't tell the rest of your classmates what it was like until after Sunday. Okay, it's a different exam, but I don't want to give people who take it on Sunday an advantage over people who took it on Wednesday. I want to make sure everyone feels fair. So just keep quiet until after Sunday, after Sunday at one. Any questions on question number one? Okay, question number two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And they're not worth as many points as the later questions. Um, there were some though, and those are true-false questions. Those are conceptual, and some of them are vocabulary. Some of them are, do you understand what this concept is? You know, and I'm, I'm using it in such a way, am I using it correctly? Does that make sense? Have you had two falses in this class before? Think about it. Yes. So how, what's a good way of studying the true false questions? And I do wanna remind you, by the way, um, I promised you or I said that we'll probably go over the normal time because I wanna make sure we talk about this test. Oh, could you clarify popping up the card? It's really easy. Let me show you. You take your piece of paper, you go like that, and you put it down. So Proctorio knows that you have it. Got it? That's easy. Okay. And same thing with the card. Um, yeah, you look back at the assignments because the assignments had true false questions. Try doing them again. See if you can answer them. Okay. Um, do you know who wrote those, by the way? Yeah, I did. Okay, so in a way, you're lucky that you have me as an instructor. Because uh, there are, I think, over 100,000 students using these now. And obviously, I don't have 100,000 students. I have, you know, 70 or something. Um, so the good news is that my test is going to be my writing. And the true false were, I wrote those. I didn't write down every, I didn't write every problem on the, on the assignments. I wrote about uh, close to half. But two falses I wrote. Okay, so that's a good, good little, you know, test. Okay, then there is multiple choice. <clears throat> and that's on vocabulary and statistics also. What kind of multiple choice do you think there might be? What do you think? Where were there a bunch of different possible ways of doing something or being something? Because that's what multiple choice is all about. 
in our class. See if you can remember. And it wasn't this week or last week. So it was a little while ago. Can you remember? One? I'm not sure what one means. Yeah, chapter one. There we go. Yeah, and chapter one, so, so sampling methods. So I could give you multiple choice of sampling methods. You have to, uh, I could give you a scenario and you have to tell me what sampling method it is. Okay. The other is statistics. What statistic is it? Or, you know, what statistic could it be? That kind of thing. Or what does the statistic represent? Or um, the other is types of data. Remember that? What kind of what kind of variable is this that could happen? There's a lot of different things that could happen on multiple choices. But I figured I'd show you these. I let you know that um, after number ten, even though it looks like they're you know there's a whole lot up to number ten, one through ten are quick, and there are fewer points than the rest because they're just concept got it didn't get it and you're done. Shouldn't take more than a minute to do each of these. Okay, so that's like ten minutes of your test maybe 20. Okay, now comes a more um, meaty problems. So the next is a written out problem on statistics. So that's going to involve some statistics. When I say statistics, remember what a statistic is? Again, first week. And remember, give me some examples of statistics. How about that? Okay, if you don't remember, let me give you some. The sample mean, sample standard deviation, the first quartile, third quartile, the median, remember all those? Okay, those are all statistics. Okay, and then, yeah, numerical characteristic of the sample is the kind of formal way of saying it. Okay, number 12, it's a binomial probability problem. Okay, you're gonna have to have, find the probability of something. Okay, and by the way, starting at number 11, most of these problems have a built-in calculator embedded in the question itself. Do you know what the calculator is? You know what it's going to look like? The one, but well, I don't get to see what you use for homework. Yeah, the one that I coded, okay? The one that I've been showing you in the spreadsheet each each week. I mean, in the, uh, sorry, in the webinar each week. So it's gonna look like that. So you wanna practice that. Uh, it's, I don't try and make it tricky or anything. And if you have any suggestions on making it easier, let me know. But let you know that that's what you're using. You're not using a handheld calculator. Um, you're not allowed to, because it looks too much like a smartphone and Proctorio will think you're using a smartphone. Okay, so no regular calculators, the, the calculator will be there for you. Got it? Okay, and, and if it's arithmetic, Proctorio has its own arithmetic calculator. Okay, so there's, after the binomial probability problem, there's a question on chart reading. What charts have we had in this class? What are our main charts? Histogram was one. What else? Hint, think the project. Box and whiskers, another. What's another? Stem and leaf. Good. Okay, it'll be one of those three. Okay, and by the way, it could be any of those three. And just because you had one doesn't mean your classmates not gonna have the same because it may have the same, may not. Um, there's three different tests. 
remember that. Okay, and they are slightly different, but try to make the same level of difficulty. Then there's a probability problem, chapter three type of problem. Got it? Okay, so that's either going to be wordy or I could give you a contingency table. Um, and then you're going to have to find probability. You should know words like and or 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 given. Okay, not just words, but know when to use and or, or given. Okay, and understand the rules of probability, understand mutually exclusive and understand independent. Got it? Okay, now, problem 15 is an expected value and standard deviation problem. What's the best way of practicing the expected value and standard deviation problem? What's the best resource? A uh, calculator is good for the calculation, but that's a very small part of the, of the problem. That's the easy part of the problem. And you should practice that once or twice. But what resource should you use? Previous assignments or our projects? Mm, the projects don't have um, expected value, by the way. Not regular assignments, not homework, keep going. I mean, everything is homework. Test is homework because you're probably doing it at home. Okay, I'm not seeing it. The discussion forum. Remember that week? So the discussion forum from last week, not this week. Okay, there are a lot of good problems, and I will tell you, I changed the numbers a bit, but I kind of took some of the problems that you guys chose just for fun. Okay, problem 16 is a uniform distribution problem. And by the way, these have like A, B, and C on them too. So uniform distribution, that assignment is a good way of find, seeing it. You could also see the examples I gave in the webinar, the example, and, and other videos. Okay, they're pretty standard, but if you don't practice, you won't do well. So promise me you practice. Okay, at least, I would say at least three different problems of each of these before you take the test. Okay, and then, as you might guess, we're going to end it with a normal distribution problem. Okay, by the way, normal distribution problem, where's a good way of finding that? Good examples? Yeah, also the discussion, okay? Because that's this week's discussion. Okay, so you basically you're being tested on everything we've done. I don't know if you've noticed that, but I wanted to kind of give you a, you know, step-by-step -step on what this test is gonna look like. And then the last one, this is, this is copied and pasted, is an extra credit. Write down one thing your instructor can do to make the class better, and one thing you feel the instructor should continue doing. Any constructive remarks will be worth full credit. I want to let you know this is extra credit. Don't let the points that it's out of fool you. The points that it's out of says 0 0.01 points, basically zero points. And that means that if you don't do it, you don't lose points. But if you do it, you get points. So you might even want to start with that problem because it's like free points. Sound good? Okay, you'd be foolish to leave this blank because everyone gets points. There's only one way to write something and not get points. And the hint is, if that happens, you'll be very happy. You know what the way is? Okay, the only way is if you got 100% on everything else then I don't give points because you got 100%. You should be dancing at that point. Okay, but I'll tell you, it's almost impossible to get everything perfect. No arithmetic errors, not, no problems with anything. Um, everyone needs extra credit. So don't just say, well, I'm going to get it all right. I don't need to bother the extra credit. 
because everyone makes mistakes. Even I, I make mistakes too. And that's the test. Uh, what happens if a factorial thinks they're looking down too much? Reading your notes or writing something on a notepad. Yeah, it'll alert me. Okay, and then I'll watch the video. And then if if all you're doing is looking down, but that's it, not a problem. You'll never hear from me. You'll never know what happened. On the other hand, if you're looking around and then you're talking to someone else on how to do a problem, it'll be very bad for you. Got it? Yeah. So let me just put it this way. If you're not cheating, you have nothing to worry about as long as your internet works. Okay, that, that should be your stress is the internet could go down and that would suck. The good news, I checked the weather report and we don't have any days like yesterday. I'm not sure those of you in Tahoe, what was it like yesterday? Yeah, it was super windy. Unfortunately, we didn't lose electricity, but those are the days we often use electricity. Um, and it doesn't look like um, Wednesday, Thursday, or Sunday is going to have any bad weather. Okay, it doesn't mean that everything is going to be 100% certain to be good on the internet, but at least that, the, uh, that, that it'll probably work. Because internet dying is, is horrible. And I can't do anything about that. Um, but I watched the weather report and it looks good. Let's hope there's not a fire in your community. I mean, there's all kinds of other things that could happen, but let's hope none of that stuff happens. Okay, um, that's pretty much what I had to say about the test. I wanted to give you a, a really good idea of what it is. So there's no real surprises. Um, the problems, they're, they're not like things that you've never seen anything like, but the, you know, they're, they're, I didn't copy any problem from anything. I wrote them all, you know, over the last week or so. Okay, and I wrote three versions. And just to let you know, um, this one through 18 is true for Wednesday, Thursday, and Sunday's version. But Wednesday, Thursday, and Sunday, they're all different, but they're equal difficulty, and they all address the same concepts. Any questions on that? Okay, I think, as I mentioned, this one's longer than usual. I told you it was gonna be, um, but I'm pretty much done with what I have to do. Let me unshare. And let's stop the recording. And I hope it goes really well for you, but I'm happy to answer questions.